you, you, I think I think yeah, that sort of drama is inevitable with any of those groups. Mm. I think most people most people play quite nicely together most of the time. I would say. Mm. Yeah. Um, certainly, most of the relationships that I've got with you know, other people on the scene, the, you know, other groups and other organisations, they're all they're all I like to think quite good. That's what you think. Well, they let me come and be in their rituals <laughs> and shit, so I assume, that, you know, perhaps behind my back, they say all, terrible, all sorts of terrible things. But, you know. Do we. I'm sure it's fine. I might. Is it possible to turn. I'm going to Yeah, yeah. Just, it's, it, it's a lot of. Turn the speaker down, then they're all just down to zero and there we go. Sweet. Yep. Do you want to speak again, Nikki? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I sort of came into the IoT ambit a little bit just as the whole ice ball stuff was finishing, so I didn't really encounter it directly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <sighs> the bumper book of questions. So the first question will start with you, Nikki, anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did all this get started for you? Oh, blimey. Um, so I suppose you have to sort of go way, way back in time to when I was quite little. And I was quite interested in the fact that my um, various of my ancestors um, were into fortune telling. So I developed a keen interest in fortune telling and stuff at quite an early age, just in a sort of like, um, what's the word, instinctive kind of way. So I knew that my grandmother had read tea leaves and cards. So I didn't have any tea leaves handy, so I got beads and would throw them onto my bed covers and try and see patterns in those and sort of read books about palmistry and that kind of thing when I was about nine, that sort of age, maybe a bit older. Um, And then later on, when I got to my teenage years, I discovered tarot cards because they were in the Games Workshop place that I was going to. It wasn't actually that, but it was was another shop, an independent one, that had all the the role-playing figures and things like that, because I was very into that with all my friends. Um, so I bought a copy of the Book of Thoth because I like the pictures mm-hmm. and then I bought the book to go with the cards because I was like, the cards are pretty, I'll have those and I bought the book to go with it to explain them to me and I was like, hmm, Alistair Crowley, who's he? I've never heard of him before I don't know that. and someone that was living in the shared house that I was in was also very into the sort of magic-y type stuff and he had a copy of Lee Null so that was my sort of uh, first encounter of the whole sort of thing Almost straight to Pete Yes, yeah, cool. yes. so I am definitely a chaos magician came sort of directly to that really Julian your girl okay um, so I've always been interested in magic for as long as I can remember and I used to spend an inordinate amount of time hanging out in the library section in Geodesimal I think 168 or something of that order with which is occult um, and uh, was just fascinated with the whole thing as a child and um began reading stuff about magic when I was probably about 10 um, and found uh, um, in the library in said occult section a book uh, by John Simmons called The Great Beast which is, you know, I'm sure you know is a, a rather unflattering but nevertheless a very amusing sort of rip-roaring yarn of the life of Alistair Crowley and uh, I thought this is this is this is brilliant. This is exactly what I wanted. And what at the time what was happening in 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 uh, kind of the culture that I was exposed to anyway was uh, Wicca was the the uh, Alexandrian Gardnerian Wicca. The Farrers were um, Stuart Farrer at the time was a uh, I think a journalist for a magazine called Tidbits, which was a sort of you know slightly titillating uh, sort of kind of women's magazine sort of thing. And so there were lots and lots of uh, articles knocking around in this magazine, which was floating around a family home, um, of these these witches doing this sort of strange stuff. And I thought that sounds completely groovy. And um, so little snippets on, uh, you know, the BBC do a little documentary about you know this. So my interest was, was sort of gathering at this point, and I spent time doing meditation. I did things like you know when I probably should have been out climbing trees and and, and things copying out uh, lists of correspondence, trawling through vast amounts of books. And retrospectively, uh, you know, someone who now identifies as a chaos magician, 
uh, what I was doing was I was looking for technique. I was looking for like how how do we do this stuff? You know, is there are there? Uh, you know, I wouldn't have expressed it like this, but are there underlying patterns within this 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 thing? But what I encountered first in terms of working magic with other people was working in Wicca, and I worked with um, in that particular style in a uh, a kind of experimental Wiccan environment. So it was a coven that had a kind of Alexandrian lineage, um, but we dispense with things like uh, an initiatory structure and we instead put in place a kind of a training structure for people who are interested in getting involved in the group. Um, we worked with that system, I worked with that system for about uh, kind of 10 years, something of that order. And I'd, I'd encountered Chaos Magic, you know, kind of indirectly. So I was um, uh, uh, working with Phil Hine at the time and knew him from that sort of you know kind of Wiccan kind of scene um, and he was at the time living in Leeds uh, a couple of um, uh, flats above where Dave Lee was living and Rodney Orpheus was kind of down the road and I kind of came into the orbit of those people uh, from that sort of Wiccan background and then kind of you know had that flirtation with Philema and various other things and I'd heard about the IOT but it, but it just seemed it seemed a bit um, I don't know a bit neo-fascist and a bit sort of uh, a bit <laughs> macho and a bit sort of you know Pete writing these articles in Chaos National about how people are leaving the OTO in droves and joining us and I'm thinking that just sounds like such nonsense um, I'm really not interested I moved to Bristol and then uh, got to, got to know uh, Pete Carroll just as a as a friend as a bloke who we used to go sort of drinking and stuff and so I kind of was was in and around that sort of orbit. It wasn't really until about what is it now, twelve years ago, thirteen years ago, something like that, that I became involved in the IOT and 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 then became, I guess, um, in terms of the writing that I've been doing. So that's become something that's more, uh, you know, chaos magic is the, the 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 name that's on the tin essentially. But my background is kind of you know. Uh, Wicca, neo-paganism, you know, that sort of side of, of, of things. Uh, so that's essentially it in a nutshell. There's um, a couple of similarities there in, in terms of uh, encountering texts in, uh, in a very early age. Uh, would you, I mean, did you have instances, uh, I mean, Nikki, you, you appear to have triggered them, but do you have instances of uh, high strangeness from your childhood that you kind of maybe informed the direction that that was going? Hmm. That's that's quite a tricky question because obviously when you're growing up everything's normal. True. So at the time there probably aren't moments of high strangeness. Um, didn't live in a haunted house. Didn't realise in retrospect. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course I lived in a haunted house. I was born in a haunted house. So I was born in a house that belonged to my grandparents, where my parents had moved into like the other the upper two stories, and grandparents lived in the bottom bottom floor. And it was the oldest part's about five six hundred years old. So, um, yeah, it was quite haunted and I had lots of strange dreams about a staircase that sort of went up to the attic and I'd go up it into my dreams and it would be all very different and stuff. So, um, And the, the sort of the local environment around it was very sort of half countryfied. so there were lots of plants, animals and things like that. So I spent a lot of time outside and I found a flint axe at one point in okay. our garden which I don't know what happened to it over the years, it's just disappeared, but I had it for a very, very long time, and I would have it, and I'd like pretend to be like sort of like a hunter, and sort of stalk around the garden and scare the chickens. I never actually caught them, obviously, I just used to collect their eggs. Um, so, so I had a very sort of strong sense of being somewhere that was very, very old, and it was very creaky floorboards, and I saw sort of like a couple of apparitions and things, as you do. Um, but n nothing that I sort of thought at the time oh this is strange it's just mm, sure. stuff that happens isn't it so. retrospective high strangers yeah. I think I think a lot of that, that sort of stuff is um, because of the kind of the the experience certainly that, that you know I had as a child I think it, it's, it's shared by lots of children is that because you're kind of coming into your your understanding of the world there are all sorts of things which um have a kind of a, a deeply magical quality about them in and of themselves. You know, I used to mm -hmm. spend a lot of time kind of out in, uh, again, you know, out in uh, nature, as it, I, I, lots of children uh, I think still do. And it's it was about uh, for me 
learning those kind of like magical techniques and trying and actually sort of deploying them. And so I would find that moments of uh, what is sometimes called um, nature mystery experience or rapture experiences would, would come upon me quite quite often. Um, I would also, I think, engage in behaviours which kind of, I think, sound strange, but I don't know how many other children kind of do the same sort of mm. stuff. So yeah. I was very interested in the idea of making gods. I was very interested in, in the idea of, um, you know, taking an, uh, an, an object. I had a... Um, a uh, one, one of those kind of classic, now probably quite kind of groovily retro uh, um, carved antelope figures, and I remember sort of you know as a child doing things like uh, um, uh, trying to sort of you know make a shrine space for this deity, and uh, you know I, as I as I lost my baby teeth, I would actually kind of offer blood to it because I it kind of felt like that's sort of the kind of spooky occult thing that you do, and so then. You know, obviously, you're you're building. For me, I was building that magical world, and I think that the sort of the ritualising behaviour that we then re-encounter as 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 adults, either within a, a you know a, a, a mystical tradition or a religious tradition or whatever, that's an, uh, um, it, we it, we feel like this is some kind of great thing that we've kind of come to, and actually, that's an inherent thing that lots of children do. I think lots of children have that uh, engagement with. Uh, the realm of the imagination and magic for me is about the realm of the imagination fundamentally it's it's you know it's using this remarkable capacity that we have to sort of you know model the world and then model the possibilities just outside of what we can currently achieve um, that's how children learn they learn you know using using their imaginative faculties that's how most of it happens um, so I mean there are incident there are, you know there are there are incidents I can kind of quote later on which um, involving, you know, encountering uh, spirits and entities and, you know, strange manifestations and all that stuff. But in terms of my childhood, it was more about a kind of magical engagement with the world. And so I didn't, if there was anything really spectacularly spooky or weird, I kind of didn't notice. I sort of, ex that's what I wanted. That's what I expected. That's what I was creating. Yeah. I had a lot of times where I... Um I wouldn't even think of them now as moments of high strangeness, but I spent an awful lot of time in my childhood meditating, which I didn't know what it was at the time. I would just climb a tree, sit there, and just look at things like hoverflies or look really closely at the leaves and the way that the light shone through it and just observe it and just completely lose myself in the moment and be like that for like two, three hours at a time. Now, in retrospect, that, that's probably a bit strange. But that's on the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's... that's that was that was what I did. So, yeah. and um, I spent a lot of time dressing up and sort of not exactly pretending to be somebody else, but wondering what it would be like if that kind of thing. I did lots and lots of reading. So, the sort of the realm of the imagination was very much the natural world around me, but also loads and loads of books. I went through at least four books a week. So I spent a lot of time doing that. So reading sci-fi stories, fantasy adventure stuff, encyclopedias, anything I could get my hands on, because there was no internet at that point. So my version of, of surfing the internet which is instead of browsing through web pages I would browse through books but to do that you had to read the whole book but I would go and take out my maximum every week on a Friday to the to the library take out my maximum quota of books read them all and then the next week change them so my 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 uh, the same basic sad sad sort of you know occult geek child I behavior. did have friends as well I, I, I used to I used to go to um, there was a shop in Northampton I think in Kettering um called Occultique, which was run by a lovely gentleman by the name of John Lovett. This is sort of back in the 80s. And uh, my parents were, you know, they were, they were lovely, you know, lovely people, very, very, very uh, tolerant and accepting of things like, you know, me taking up all the uh, carpet tiles and painting a big, um, you know, magic pentagram and circle and, you know, painting the bedroom black, which of course everyone tries to do, but and then, then trying to sort of cover it with ancient Egyptian-style frescoes. And I used to go up to Occultique and they would give me my sort of Christmas money and say, you know, here's your 50 quid that you can spend. And I would spend like a whole day just wandering around the bookshelves reading all this amazingly fascinating stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I, so I encountered like the magical te technology quite kind of early on. Um, and uh, you know, have memories of you know having to wait till my parents were out so I could kind of you know go and do go and do rituals in the bedroom and uh, and, and you know try not to set off you know smoke alarms and things the amount of incense smoke. Well, that was back in the day before smoke alarms, in fact. So. Mm, I remember that. I remember. Oh, they're out. I've got forty-five minutes. 
Everyone else masturbated. I was doing magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't have smoke alarms either, but that really triggered. Uh, uh, I hadn't thought of that, but that the, those between spaces that the children get in a house, it, it, and you on that sort of threshold of either adulthood or adolescence, where your parents can leave you in the house for forty-five minutes and assume you won't summon demons or set the place on fire. <laughs> Jokes on them. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> That's an uh, uh, interesting analysis, I think, of um, whether children even have, unless they're, you know, abducted or what have you, um, th- there's a different yardstick for measuring high strangeness amongst children because in the inevitable conversations, usually drunk at Christmas parties or what have you with, you know, normals, when this stuff comes out, they and their eyes widen and they wait for you to finish your hopefully relatively innocuous, innocuous description of what it is you do. And then the first thing out of their mouth is a story from their childhood about, I saw my aunt after her funeral or, or, or something. Mm-hmm. So they, 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 it would, I think, make sense that what we would now consider high strangeness is, is quite universal, which means the difference between magicians and otherwise is the people who don't switch that off. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Because, I mean, it, 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 most of the... If I think of the, uh, you know high strangeness kind of uh, incidents that, that, that I've experienced it's, it's, it's quite it's quite tricky because it's not a category that I use I don't think you know what are, no. what are the really strange things and, and of course there is a there is the case for sort of saying that lots of uh, very successful magic just looks like the world the world hangs together because of magic so that's you know it's it's an everyday phenomena in, in many respects um, there are certainly things that you know, I can kind of point to um, some of which I've kind of banged on about in print, um, but I guess also with that whole magician's attitude, like uh, for, for me, one of the interesting things about magic generally and about chaos magic specifically is the idea that you know an event takes place, and there are multiple readings of that event. You know, in that sense, it's informed by that you know the whole uh, story of postmodernity and all the rest of it. That so yes, I could register some of these things as highly strange, but I but they're, they're mostly you know, just the category of you know, stuff that happens in the universe, which can be viewed in lots of different ways. Um, and and uh, in the case of children, um, they why would they discriminate about those things? Because because they haven't had this you know um, uh, particular view of the universe that, that, that these things are you know, unusual. Yeah, a couple of the sort of stranger things in my childhood were things that were quite long term, so they're not like an event that happened. It's much more just a, a situation that occurred, and I'm sort of like now looking back at it and I'm like, mm, that was quite strange. But it's not things that happened, it was the way that I was thinking about stuff. So one of them was that um, my grandmother, who we lived with, she died when I was seven years old. Now, obviously, I knew her quite well, but when I was about 11 or so, someone had asked me something about her and I realised I had no memories of her at all. They're completely gone. I couldn't remember anything at all about her. I couldn't remember how she looked or anything we'd done together or like nothing. It was just like blank. So, and I was like, that's very strange. I have since recovered a few very brief sort of like moments, but that whole sort of section somehow disappeared. And I was like, at the time I was thinking, hmm, that's quite odd because that shouldn't happen. I could remember loads of stuff that had happened in my life up to that point, including things a lot, lot earlier, but nothing about her. So that's a strange thing. That is interesting. Um, and another strange thing I can remember is that it was while I was still living at this old house. We moved when I was about nine, so it was before then. And um, I'd watched some BBC Two programme about philosophy, as they used to have in those days <laughs> when they had intellectual stuff. Yeah. Um, and it had been describing the idea of solipsism on this programme. And I remember standing at the front gate and leaning on it and sort of like thinking, so, so maybe all this stuff is just in my head, OK, so uh, I'll try that out for a few days and see if it makes sense. So for a few days I went around and believed that it was all just in my own head and like there was no external reality as such. There was, there was a, my limited understanding of the whole mm-hmm. sort of idea of solipsism at that age. Um, and then I can remember coming to the sort of conclusion at the end of it and sort of like watching loads of people walking past and going, but all those people, I know from talking to people that I've never met before, that they have a whole world inside their head as well. And like, if everybody's got a world inside their head that's so detailed and so like complete, that can't all exist in my head as well. So solipsism's a load of rubbish. But the fact that I'd actually decided to try it out for a few days is the strange thing, looking back at it. That's, is that normal? 
Cool. It is the Chaos Magicians. Born, not made. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just the, the way that I was doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a lot of time thinking about thinking and that sort of stuff as, as people. Yeah, I mean, I spent loads of time you know, sort of meditating yeah. and staring at various kind of, you know, groovy symbols and, and, and going into kind of odd states of consciousness. But it was, you know, that's also from, it, it was both... You know, naturally what children um, spend their time doing they, they kind of you know explore states of awareness all the time well, that's why they yeah. spin round and 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 sit down yeah. you know um, but but it was also intentionally what I was, was doing because I encountered the magical vocabulary so mm. so early on yeah. that, that um, you know it was um, I, I was kind of conceptualising things in that way from, from yeah quite, quite early on really. I don't know how anyone makes sense of the world without even some understanding of uh, ritual ontology because I, I agree, I th- but I sort of encountered mine by around 13, so um, it gives you an additional input into adolescence and emerging into adulthood if you can mm. think about it in, in terms of these things, uh, and then also the entire world once you, uh, once you reach adulthood. Yeah, it's, 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 it's it, the thing about being a magician is that the, you know, the, it's, a, it's a whole world view and uh, you know, I sometimes kind of jokingly think about it as being a sort of uh, a particular mental illness, and one day we'll find the gene for it, and we'll be able to sort of therapize people, and it will be fine. But in the short term, I think the magicians are people who, having got this condition, they gather together, you know, via internet sites and books and publications and magical orders, and self therapize and help them uh, each other. And that really, we should be getting funding from the government. And that's my position. <laughs> yeah. It's mutual support yeah. groups. Yes, yeah, mutual Absolutely. support group. Yeah. 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 Think of the people who keep off the streets and out of mental hospitals. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, when it works. Uh, to circle back to, I guess, where we almost uh, ended the autobiography, um, we're going to come back to Julian and Leeds and that moment because I actually think that's quite important for uh, Chaos Magic's story. Uh, but Nikki, because you've been with the IoT uh, and are obviously quite senior in the IoT, um, would you tell us the story of how you found it and joined and so on, and why you're still there? Mm, okay, so um, so I found the IoT because of um, so there was sort of a there was sort of heard a uh, to go back to the thing so. There was the book, the book of Libanella, sort of like saw that and sort of like vaguely entered my consciousness that it, that it existed. But then I moved from this place, which was Colchester, and I moved to London for a couple of years. Um, and during that time, I worked in an office uh, doing accountancy type stuff, very, very, very boring, VDU operating, that kind of stuff. Um, and didn't really do anything magical at all. I read some more stuff. I read The White Goddess by Robert Graves, mm-hmm. and I read The Masks of God by Joseph Campbell cover to cover good which is a feat very few other yes. people have managed no, you are shaming me <laughs> with, I, with either of those things yeah. <laughs> so I was, I was very sort of still into the sort of how people think about stuff and very into history and all that kind of thing um, and then but I still had contacts back in Colchester so I'd go back and visit sometimes and on um, one of my visits there I hooked up with um, a person who then became my partner briefly and he was really obsessed with the IoT and chaos magic so through him, that was how I sort of like got to know that. I moved up to Norwich at that point because I was having a bit of a nervous breakdown from the whole sort of like being in an office and it was all a bit too ordinary for me. It yeah. didn't suit my personality at all. I not know anything about that. Yeah, so I just left my job, moved to Norwich and took up the whole sort of quest of joining the IoT at that point, um, which I managed to do at age 22, I think I was long time ago um, so yeah so I, I joined at that point and we had a little group going in Norwich with a few people and uh, would go down to London to some of the meetings there and gradually got, got to know different people sort of via that we had a little chaos magic fanzine called Callisti that we, we put out together um, which had some quite interesting stuff in it we had Phil Hine writing for it under a um, I think his name was was it Mincing Machine I think was his Something name like that he chose yeah, yeah. Sorry, and yeah. um, Charles Brewster for our corns on wrote a couple of bits for it as well so we had a sort of few different things going on like that and in touch with a few different people um, and then got to know more people obviously in the IoT as time went on and 
eventually rose rose through the ranks. Rose through the ranks. Descended. Got thrust the through the ranks. <laughs> yeah. Did you do the full KKK and all that? Um, yes, I have done. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I did MMM obviously before I started it because that's how it works. And then, which I did for 18 months, because at that point there was a bit of a sort of confusion about who was supposed to be initiating us. So no one did for ages, because someone thought someone else was in charge of it, and then they weren't. And it was all like, oh, so I just kept doing it for ages and ages. But eventually, it was recognised and, and we got done, so that was quite nice. And in terms of longevity, I mean, have you stuck around for the vast wealth and, and um, celebrity that comes with it? Oh, absolutely. All the sort yeah. of like the big cars and the fancy yeah. houses yeah. and, you know, the adoration of, of thousands of acolytes, yep. all that kind of stuff. Is it? I did it the just... international dra- jet travel. Absolutely. You know. <laughs> I think I saw you at the Golden Globes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was it something... Once you sort of encountered the current that you resonated with and said, actually, I, quite, I, can, I can do things with this. Yes, I really liked the way that it was a very... Um, it allowed me to do lots of playing with different ways of believing in things. So I could... It allowed me to stay sane whilst still being properly believing in the fact that magic exists as well, mm-hmm. which is a, a nice trick that Chaos Magic allows you to do because you go, right, I am... Um, and I think other, other, other currents allow you to do this as well, but Chaos Magic explicitly encourages you to do this. It says, right, I'm going to believe this now. And you really believe it and you go into your thing, uh, um, whether it's the runes or whatever system it is that you're studying, and you totally see that as how the world is made up and all the sort of like things there. But then you can step away from it and go, yeah, but psychologically it's just that I'm just doing these things. So for me, that was something that really appealed because I'm basically a very rational materialist pragmatic kind of person so I really liked that I didn't have to always like 24 hours a day seven days a week go for different sort of like beliefs in spirits or whatever it was at the time so I like that I like the people I like the playful attitude I liked how intense it could be um, and also the light touch that it allowed you to have as well and I liked that it allowed you to do lots of different things because I'm very what's the word uh Catholic, is that the right word? Broad yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So we have like a really broad base of different things that we're interested in. Um, so for instance, when I did my ecology degree, I did all sorts of things that didn't make any sense to anybody else because I wanted to learn about animals and plants and land management and history and all. So that doesn't make sense. And when I was doing other sort of different things in my life, I can't pick one thing. I have to choose all of them. So Chaos Magic lets you do that so I can learn about runes, tarot cards, Kabbalah, um, Wiccan stuff, and also make things up. Absolutely. So that that's what appealed to me. And also, it, mostly it was the people. I've made some very very good friends over the years. Some of whom um, are still around, like the lovely Dave Lee. True. Yeah. Um, uh, who's, who's I believe the only person who's been in it longer than me. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah. Off with his head. No, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> But there, there, are, there are a lot of people from a similar time to when I joined or shortly afterwards who are still involved and so yeah I've got a very strong relationship with them because of the sort of the ways when you're doing magic together with people you have very intense engagement with people so they are my tribe I like it what a great yeah. place to end yeah. um, would you just picking up on what you said because um, that sort of uh, escape valve that Chaos Magic has um, to allow you to actually go quite deeply into something and retain at least the outer semblance of sanity. Do yeah. you think, because uh, I've often wondered this, if there is uh, some as yet undiagnosed um, behavioral disorder which allows people, uh, kind of like Asperger's or um, uh, not schizoid personality, but avoidant personality disorder that allows. Uh, a subsection of the population to actually switch beliefs on and off because it's a charge that's uh, leveled at chaos magic going well you're not really believing you're play acting I beg to differ I really am actually believing it and mm. then I really am switching it off mm. and I wonder if there is some part of that kind of spectrum that because it's it's largely irrelevant to kind of the functioning of the mental health of the world uh, if, there's a, if there's some part of people who resonate with this that just matches uh, a way that their mind potentially functions. Julian? I wonder if that's just um, about the the natural kind of settings of a human being. So if you imagine that when we're born, we have a, like a graphic equaliser, a series of settings in terms of our behaviours. And so some people, I think, find uh, one 
spiritual system or no spiritual system or whatever. And in, in terms of, you know, there's that uh, subsection of the person of the of the, the, the population who are the, the magicians. And, you know, I often characterise magicians as being those, you know, on one level they're, they're kind of... Um, uh, rather grandly, these sort of you know avant-garde experimenters of, uh, of, of, of of culture. They they are essentially also slightly expendable. So you, you move into a new environment, and one of them says, hey, "Yeah, let's send the magicians out to find what what you can eat here." So the magician then pre- presents, you know, I've just I've just eaten a couple of these berries to you, another magician. Uh, I've done I've done two. Do you want to try one of these berries? <laughs> and that's what magicians do. So you've got the population of magicians, and they have, for some reason in our culture, there are some people who, who end up having that uh, apparently anachronistic, bizarre self-identification. And then within that population, there are going to be some people who just find the system, druidry, whatever it happens to be, Eastern mysticism, and they're going to go really deeply into that, and that will become the thing that speaks to them. And then there are those other people um, who are people like us, who are uh, chaos magicians. In terms of their, their orientations into the world and their ability to go into a particular belief system, into a particular way of experiencing the universe, to really engage with that and to learn from that, and then to have strategies to bring them out of that and, and into something else or into another position from which they can observe their own behaviour. So, so I, I guess it's just, a, just that's just a natural human variation, really, of this obscure subset of people with a mental illness. <laughs> I was flicking through. What's the name of the American book of all the different things that you can have? DSM. Yeah. DSM. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I was flicking through DSM. I think it was number four. It was so many years ago. I was flicking through it, and there's a, a thing called latent schizophrenia, which completely and exactly matches the psychological profile of curse magicians. Because it's about that you can entertain all these like bizarre ideas and really believe in them, but it doesn't actually affect your normal functioning life. And that's the difference between schizophrenia and latent schizophrenia, according to this book. Yeah, well, yeah. Which is, it's it's about self care fundamentally, isn't yeah, it? You're yeah. pulling so the right you, part of the building you're remembering to eat. If you can manage to do sort of like going to the supermarket and no one stares at you, you're probably doing quite well. Yeah, True. That's, that's the sort of basic level that it comes down to. True. Um, I want to bring it back to Leeds, just because mm. I seem to have managed to keep the chronology in my head, which I'm impressed with, uh, because I do think that's quite an important point. Uh, you could potentially make the case that uh, chaos magic, as um, we have it today, was at least conceived in the North, mm-hmm. um, if mm. it was born in London or what have you. But um, if you were kind of kicking around with um, Phil and Dave, there must be reasonably good stories you'd care to share. Well, just, uh, just in... in um uh, I like to think of that part of the world as the cradle of chaos because that yeah, sounds, you know, alliteration is quite nice. Um, uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting time. I mean, I, I for me, I just um, uh, finished doing a lot of the kind of Wiccan stuff that I'd uh, been previously engaged with, and knew Phil from my connection with that. And he was publishing with Rodney Orpheus uh, uh, another zine at the time, which was called Pagan News. And it was the first kind of monthly news sheet. I can't remember how long it ran, for about maybe two years, something like this. Mm. Yeah, and that was when I got to know him. Yeah, and so, so, you know, Phil and, and, and Rodney were kind of very much involved in that project, you know, desktop publishing with this thing on an Atari ST, um, and it was all good. Um, and, uh, yeah, Daily was living in the, in the, in the, in, in, uh, the, the, at the same building as, as Phil at one stage. Um, and we just kind of spent a summer kind of hanging out, and it was, you know, there there, there was uh, quite a kind of sense of um, the, particularly with the the magazine that Rodney and Phil were doing, because it was this, uh, you know, monthly publication, there, and there were lots of interesting things happening at the time. There was the whole um, satanic panic stuff that happened, which really galvanised the sort of community to come together in an interesting way. There was, you know, the IoT and Council International were were were, were happening, um, and I think that the thing that I really took away from that, again, that sort of feeds back into me as a chaos magician, was that there were lots and lots of these different streams coming in together, and that's what made it really interesting. There was the the you know, neo pagan people and the, the uh, who were sort of running camps and things up in that part of the world. There were people like, you know, Rodney who was kind of. Um, just I think starting his own process with his uh, relationship with the OTO kind of at at that stage Phil was um, uh, also involved with 
uh, some of the Amucos current at the time. And so it was that kind of blending together. It was really, really you know, interesting, interesting um, uh, period. Um, I think you need to speak to Phil. Really. Oh, he will he'll be able to give you the, the on dirt on that. Definitely. <laughs> Not for this trip. I've already spent enough. Um, what do you think is different? What are the key differences between then and now uh, in terms of uh, magic culture? The internet. That's it. I did a piece. There's um, a bit of academic writing that I did. Um, we went in a collection called uh, I think it's called the New Generation Witches or something. Um, uh, and basically, what what we, uh, I did is I did a bit of kind of um, you know participant observation stuff and, and sat down with um, a woman who's uh, uh, a Wiccan. 20 years my junior and we just talked about our experiences of magic and then we just compared the two accounts and looked at the the, the, the differences and the difference is the internet the difference is the fact that I can go to the box in the corner of the room or I can go to the smartphone and I can type in some keywords and I can get all this stuff and um, for me growing up in terms of my engagement with the magic community like you Nikki it was, it was about uh, um, hard copy zines that were being produced you know, there was a, a system whereby a lot of the magazines that were published would have uh, a page devoted to all the other names and addresses of all the other magazines, and that was just kind of carried free of charge. And it was part of that idea of like we're starting to build this community here. Um, but uh, you know, so that, and that was um, that led to you know all kinds of um, lots of meetings, lots of camps. This probably the same kind of level that happens now, but just the the accessibility of, of of both kind of primary text knowledge that you've got with the internet and the ability to communicate with other people, that's a huge difference. And that's all the result of magic. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Nikki? What are the differences in your observation? Um, well, apart from what's already been said, I think that, um, let me see. For me personally, it seems that magic has become much more acceptable, whereas 20 years ago, it wasn't. Yeah, it was much more spooky because you had the media version of the occult via the news of the world and such like, and tippets as we Indeed. mentioned before, which my nan used to have. Yeah. Um, so the occult at that point was very much presented as scary, very very dangerous, that sort of glamour around it. Whereas now it isn't. It's much more seen as a sort of a version of religion, spirituality type of stuff would be the sort of way. Yeah, that that's, that's, a that's a huge difference. Shift. I mean, the fact that, you know, if you're admitted to hospital <coughs> these days in Britain, you can put, you know, pagan or whatever on your forms. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, um, uh, uh, employers need to be sort of, you know, aware of those things. The fact that kind of culturally, although, you know, those kind of scapegoating and unpleasant behaviours um, still happen in relation to the, the magic community, um, I think that... The, the the kind of even the sort of quite hardcore practices themselves of like doing rituals it's mm -hmm. like you know here's a bunch of pagans doing a ritual that's what it looks like guys you know let's move on um, and the fact that a lot of the kind of the technologies of magic mm -hmm. um, uh, recast as things like you know psychology and NLP and you know um, uh, co cognitive therapies and so on those are out there in culture and they're very very broad in culture you know it's, it's like and it's, advertising theory and all that kind of stuff it's like Terry well. says we're infiltrating well, and taking over manipulation of symbols is it's just a, a thing that you can study mm. so. I did yeah that's why I picked it mm -hmm. um, I also think it, it, there's some very specific and potentially quite powerful tech that seems to have uh, just sort of been absorbed into the dominant culture. I mean, I was uh, would have been about a year ago in the office. Um, some girl had just broken up with her boyfriend, and the girl next to her, who had zero um, zero interest or background in magic, was sort of like write his name on a piece of paper, put it in a bag of water um, with some chili powder, put it in the freezer. Uh, and that's some very specific folk magic, and mm -hmm. that's it's, it's one example. But you can you, you have the actual um, tech being bandied around by people in in the in the dominant culture, which I think is a it's kind of a, a leading indicator that um, you're right. It is it's it's moving into if not acceptability into the same level of well, actually, I don't give a crap uh, that everything else falls into in in 21st century culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and because of that, people that do practice magic aren't <coughs> so um, guarded about it, so they don't have to have that sort of posturing um, kind of 
wall of don't come near me, which they needed to before. Mm. So that's something that I've noticed in the within the IoT is that at that point it did have that sort of slightly. I don't know what's the you said neo fascist sort of way. Like, it's not quite like that, but it was very much everyone dressed it was, in black. It was, it was. It was all very serious and po faced and warm, a bit macho. It was the same as the Temple of Psychic like Youth at the time. I mean, oh, the yeah, Temple yeah, of Psychic yeah, Youth yeah, wasn't yeah, exactly kind of like, hey guys, welcome, welcome. Well, it was, but like in a scary Come way, down, with pictures yeah, yeah, of yeah. Pop and just yeah. and, you know, yeah. and that was the vibe, and that was exactly, that was completely yeah. and it was understandable. Partly to keep out people that yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't want to know yeah, yeah, about yeah, what's going yeah. on. So it's a bit of a testing kind of thing. But culturally, you're right. I mean, certainly in terms of the IoT, more broadly in terms of magic there is a there is a, a kind of softening at the edges and 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 you know very occasionally people go oh, this is a terrible thing you know this is taking away from the true gnosis and that's bollocks <laughs> <laughs> obviously you know the world runs on magic and people should be aware of the fact that the world runs on magic and they mm. should horrible overuse word i know but be empowered to understand that the world runs on magic and that the the, the, the techniques are accessible to everyone and um you know Dear old Crowley, bless him, you know, first try, you know, nice go. Pity about all the stuff in Greek, but nevertheless, you know, but people should know this shit. People should know it. So we're going to go and tip some LSD in the water now? That would be good. Oh, wait, no, I've done the maths. It doesn't work out. It's not worth it. And anywhere that's got chlorine in the water, it doesn't work either because it just neutralizes it straight away. So, Damn it. Oh, well. My tomorrow just opened up. Fair enough. Um... So we've got, I, I think that's fair. I mean, I began, uh, and interestingly, it kind of ties the two of them together. If you grow up in regional Australia before the internet, um, I was quite fortunate in that we had one independent bookstore that was within, I wouldn't say easy walking distance, it was about an hour. And I'd walk down the hill uh, with money that I'd either got through um, stealing from my mother, who knew the whole time. I mean, she would take yeah. out... Oh, Money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. I, I, if you, if I got to her wallet on Friday, there was like unlimited money in there because that's when she would take the money out to buy the stuff for the house so I would take it out and go oh, she'll never miss this <laughs> of course she missed it because she can't count Running, yeah. <laughs> but she said nothing because she quickly worked out I'm not spending it on crack I'm spending it on books um, but we were I, I was particularly fortunate because the, uh, the woman who didn't own the store she worked in it she worked in it for about 35 years she's recently retired and the store's closed but um, she would, there was one incident where there was a cafe next door and I was there, it would have been about 15 or 16, so I'd been shopping there for a few years now and I was out with friends and she saw me because I kind of waved as we walked into the cafe. She came in as we were um, into a, into the cafe holding a book which was a used copy of Rigardi's Complete Golden Dawn, which uh, had a broken spine and I still have it, uh, for $20 and she saw me walking along and said, he will want this book. Uh, and so I had, uh, obviously there was the sort of um, broad publishing uh, Llewellyn stuff, but uh, I had someone who was quite fortunate who would pick things and bring them into the store and actually physically ring up the customers around the town and say, I've got this, you might like it. And she put them away. It was all first names, proper book selling stuff that we're, that we're missing. Uh, but we do, um, we can lament that on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm getting to my question. On the other hand, we do have, as you say, with a smartphone, we can get the complete uh, Corpus Hermetica with just by typing that in right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, why, or has there been, because that's a leading question otherwise, has there been uh, an uplift in, I don't want to say skill, uh, but uh, practice and level of discourse now that uh, in some ways, at least in the developed world, uh, access to these texts has been democratized in a way that I certainly didn't have, and the stories that um, you guys had, you know, we, we had to work for it. I had to walk miles and, and steal and what have you. I then went to get a job to feed my addiction. I didn't just spend my childhood stealing. I do need to point that out. <laughs> 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 but do you think, because this, I, um, the internet is, I mean, it's been quite disruptive to more or less every sector of society, but do you think in particular, now that people have access to these things, it, it, should have, it should have been Florence during the Renaissance, and I'm just wondering if that's happened. That's interesting, because there's a whole thing about how knowledge arrives at you, changes what you perceive it to be, like whether it's authentic and how important it is and all things like that. So if you can just type it in and it's there, it's not as important as if someone's sort of like, you sort of, someone's just brought something into a shop and then you come in five minutes later and find it there. It's like it was meant to happen. So things have less significance when you just be able to find them. 
is one side of that, and it's also to do with like um, h how you receive different types of things. So if I'm just like making up a poem, I make up a poem. But there was one occasion where I was in a tent and it was night time and I was lying down. I was half asleep because it was raining, so I couldn't actually sleep properly. And I could hear in under the ground. I could hear this sort of like these these voices. And they were chanting something. They weren't obviously, but that was that was how I was perceiving it at the time. And so I was like writing this down because I was like, well, I might as well write it down because it sounds quite good. So I wrote this poem and it was like I'd heard it from the ground. And that's very different for me, just like sitting there with a bit of paper and scribbling it. Mm. Yeah. So it's a really important poem to me. It's not necessarily that much better, but the way that you receive things is completely different. So if you've just sort of been able to find it really easily, it does change it, but it does mean more people have access to it. On the other hand, so. Yeah, as it's it's it's, it's you know inevitably um, you know, has a variety of different uh, effects. I mean, the fact that I, I, I guess it's, it's the availability of the text is one thing. There's also with the internet the availability of interaction with people. Yeah, and that's the that's the thing that I think is 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 also really interesting. And and obviously within all of this, whether it's published material online or otherwise, there's always trying to. Um, encourage people to be critical and 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 thoughtful about the you know the sources of information and, and so on. Um, I I don't know. I, I guess it, for me the the fact that people have got access to all of those those texts is great. The fact that it allows people to interact is probably better. And if that galvanises people to practice and to experiment and to explore then then fabulous mm. um, I mean I uh, spend time hanging out in some of the chaos magic uh, Facebook groups <laughs> and just observing the, the the amusing range of interactions that happen there um, and uh, it's it's you know it's been quite interesting looking at uh, things like uh, attempts at doing sort of group activity within those spaces um, which don't seem to work terribly well no. don't seem to work terribly well so um, what I hope is that um, people find good ways of doing that online I mean there have been sort of attempts like like with Arkinor in college at looking at sort of you know are there other ways of, 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 of making that interaction be about actual practice because that's the thing you yeah. know it's yeah. all yeah it's all very well having all this information there but unless you're actually doing the things you sometimes you get overwhelmed with the flood of information and think that you're doing something just by looking up more and more texts but it's really you just want to have one and just do it mm. for two years. Yeah. I think as as time goes on, people will get a bit more sophisticated about how mm. this thing. And as, I know, sort of looking at the youth of today, they they engage with the internet in a very very different way to people of my generation, oh, and they're much more savvy and aware of source material and where things come from and checking it and all that kind of stuff. Or well, certainly the youth that I'm in, encountering now. They are. Um, however, what I don't want to say it troubles me because the world will do what the world does. Um, the younger generations who don't use Facebook because they view it the way we view LinkedIn, um, it's something the average age is approaching 40 if it's not over. Um, Facebook's very cagey about this. And even Twitter is getting too long in the tooth for them, so they use things like Snapchat. Uh, and still Tumblr, although, again, that's suffering the same kind of um, inevitable demographic drift that um, Facebook has and this younger generation is better at source material and not as good at creating it uh, they don't create as much of it um, and uh, if you look because uh, I mean this used to be my job but if you look at the uh, demographic analysis of say sub 20 uh, they're actually a lot more conservative when it comes to their life goals um, they want a stable job with the government as opposed to say the generation above who wanted to burn the government down and get everyone high and stay high forever. And I just, for me, I, I wonder if, um, I wonder if magic is finally reaching uh, a post-internet period because there is, I mean, the Akinorian College is a good example. I mean, you obviously, you're VC, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, I'm not at all affiliated with it, but it is quite online, offline. It's different to say a Facebook group. There is a lot of yeah. real world um, components to it, and people hang out together and and what have you. So it's um, it is facilitated online, but it is both. And mm -hmm. I wonder if like Seth's event that's coming up, mm -hmm. um, which is quite well programmed. Um, I wonder if and the rise of um, 
the rise of independent publishing in a way that isn't just um, everyone publish their own things, a, a mediated publishing where mm-hmm. um, the return of books and the return of groups. And I do wonder, and actually, to be honest, cross my fingers, that um, we're reaching, the internet will never go away, but we, uh, hopefully, I wonder if magic has fallen out of love with the idea, because the, I, we were just talking about the Z cluster before I turned record on. I remember trying to do via a 28.8 modem from Sydney, Australia, uh, participate in a um, digital ritual that was run out of New Orleans or, or whatever mm-hmm. it happened to be. And it was rubbish. Like, I know it was amazing, <laughs> but it's not. Like, that, that was the tech. The group was fantastic. The group was really fun and that kind of wild, anarchic um, 90s thing. And they don't quite work that well online. Mm. Uh, there's a Dionysian group on Facebook which seems to have... Uh, be attempting that sort of online offline thing where they essentially notify people we're doing a global event on this day we're doing this do these things and I I think that's good I think that's the way to do it rather than everyone log on to your Facebook and and chant I don't know (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean there have been uh, you know all all sorts of interesting experiments with using the internet itself as a magical tool and I agree I think that what's basically happening in culture is that um, uh, I mean I'm in my mid 40s and therefore um you know, the internet is something that's happened during my lifetime, it's emerged during my lifetime. Um, and I think that the generations to follow us, assuming that, you know, the oil doesn't all run out, we're just not looking through the garbage for, you know, tins of food with weapons blazing. Assuming the internet carries on, it will just kind of chill out, basically. And uh, what will happen is that, you know, the um, people will find ways of using um, internet-style technology to do magical work. But... You know the the reason people are interested in th- people, you know, organisations like the OTO and the IOT and you know um, the Order of Bards, Eights and Druids and all of those kind of people and the reason that those groups are all um, flourishing is because people actually want to physically get together and share time you know, absolutely in meet space and that um, I think you see that in um, all aspects of wider culture you have knitting groups you have the rise of book clubs you have the rest of this stuff where mm-hmm. people are. It, the internet will inevitably become a utility, a, a pipe, mm-hmm. uh, rather than the future. And it's, uh, I hope that's the case, because if it's the future, it's fucking awful. Um, and I've had my entire career in digital media, and I will freely say that it's just, it should just be a pipe that spooks can look at when they want to. <laughs> and we can, carry on, we can carry on with the rest of our lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And if, it, if the other eventuality happens, then bring on an EMP or some kind of solar injector event and, uh, and let's be done with it. Which could happen. I mean, you know, there's a lot of magicians and pagans out there that um, have an affinity with soul, so if that happens we'll just wake it up. <laughs> Alright. Well, Back to the bubble now. book of yeah, questions. Just need to make sure we, we did that. I already did the childhood incidents of high strangeness one. Uh, neither of you were abducted by aliens. Mildly disappointed. Um, Sorry. Oh, this is good. Uh, and I'm going to start with Julian uh, for previous uh, book reasons. Best films and books for delivering magical concepts, in your opinion. We're talking fiction. Um, so, uh, for the Kabbalah, uh, Promethea. Mm. Um, which is just fantastic and hilarious Absolutely. and really engaging and 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 um, oh, it's got some just awesome ideas in it. It's glorious artwork. Um, the idea of doing that whole sequence of going up the tree in the key scale colours of the Sephira. I mean, you know, wow, brilliant. Yeah. So that. Um, uh, a, a movie that I watched recently, we both watched recently, which is Cloud Atlas, mm-hmm. which I think is a really interesting way of looking at the interconnectedness of things and appreciating that magic is a long game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, those will do for starters, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the obvious book is Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. Of course. Uh, That's the go to place for magical technique. Of all sorts of different flavors. True, true. You can't be a magician unless you've read them right. I think. Agreed. He's got so much stuff in there, which is really useful. Um, so yeah, that would be my sort of like thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And also just loads of sci-fi things. Like I said, I read loads of that when I was a sort of early adolescent, sort of like twelve-ish kind of age, twelve to fourteen. I read the entire sci-fi section at my local library, um, and loads of that stuff was 
very formative on my sort of ways of looking at the world and ways that people can interact with it. It's not directly or overtly magical, but it, a lot of it, because it's sort of set in different types of worlds, it makes you look at your world as just a version that's, that's of how thing. you look at yeah. the world. And that was what transferred over to me. So even uh, so, a lot of things by like, your classic sci-fi authors, from Isaac Asimov through to sort of Harry Harrison, all those type of things. Mm. Um, and uh, Harry Harrison in particular, because he's, he's, a lot of his characters very much live double lives. So you have this sort of like spy kind of attitude, which is something that goes along with the, that way of thinking. I think is something that a lot of, I don't know if a lot of magicians have it, but I think a lot of chaos magicians have it, where they have mm. sort of like a, I've got a secret, interesting life where I do exciting things, but I mustn't show anybody. I must be normal on top of it and just wear jeans and T-shirts and it's all fine. But really underneath, everything's really cool. <laughs> So the sci-fi type That's stuff. That's the schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's latent. So but it's, it's all good. Control. It's all it's good. Fine. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so, so a lot of the sci-fi fantasy, that sort of playing with other world type stuff, where you get, which you get into with Blade Runner and things, there's a sort of a, a because obviously Philip K. Dick was very into all of that kind of sort of, mm. type mm. of way madness of looking at the world. He wasn't so latent in his different things, um, but a lot of that shaped how I can engage in the world as a story and sort of with different plot, plot lines and things. So although it's not overtly magical, I'm trying to think of any sort of TV programmes or series or anything. There's obviously sort of like all the different sort of Moon Stallion and all stuff like that. And Cat that, Weasel. That's what I was trying to think of. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're the fan of that, so... Brilliant. Nothing works. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the way that, you know, yeah, uh, uh, in... Um, one of the delights of having children is I can, I can go, oh, kids, it's telly from the 70s, check it out. And uh, mostly they really like it, which is great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, things like Cat Weasel are really hilarious because you've got this, 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 this failed magician who's clearly not a failed magician because he's managed to m- move himself through 900 years worth of time. Um, and the way that the stories, again, going back to that childhood thing, the way that the magic that actually unfolds in the story, and there always is magic, looks like this kind of comedy of errors of, sort of the normal world with a just a dusting of of kind of you know poetic irony almost and that's how a lot of magic works in my opinion in my experience yeah. anyway yeah there's loads of children's books which directly deal with the idea of magic and fairies and all that kind of mm. stuff obviously so um jack and Ori, which was on when we were young um that probably had an awful lot of influence and in sort of like how you sort of engage with spirits and the sort of like the when you, you have your traditional fairy story of like person goes out into the world meets some character that needs some sympathy they do that and then it turns out that this sort of like either small animal or old person or whatever is actually a really powerful magic thing and then they go on an adventure and that's something that happens through loads of different books um tv stuff uh oh i don't know um other pieces of uh I mean, a lot of early 70s children's TV was pretty strange, even if it wasn't actually magical. So things like Bagpuss and the Clangers and all those sort of like otherworldly... Yeah, man, have you seen The Night Garden? That's free. That's, yeah, that's just old. It's great. It's oh, I like yeah. it. It's like a kind of DMT vision. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, that's not really particularly magical, is it? It's just old. No, but it can, it can trigger things. I mean, that's... Mm. Um, yeah. No shout-out for The Invisibles from A Chaos Table? No? I really like Invisibles. Okay. I thought it was very good. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I uh, encountered it sort of later. Um, but, um, I yeah, I mean, I, feel, I think the thing about the Invisibles is, it is it, it, it's the um, magnificent seven of chaos magic, isn't it? It's kind of like, you know, and, and the, the, the delightful thing is I have met those people over the years. It's brilliant, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think it's a very, very... Uh, uh, good description, and again, it has that kind of like magic everydayness, you know. And it's 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 um, you know away from that sort of uh, uh, kind of you know Harry Potter esque version of magic, where magic is a, a stuff that is sort of projected out of a wand. It's much more magic kind of embedded in in um, in those events. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's authors like um, uh, Alan Garner. Who I think is a fantastic writer um, uh, and and treats a lot of kind of deeply magical subjects. Um, and there's a book called Red Shift, which he wrote, and he's you know he's quite a sort of you know, well known, primarily a sort of uh, teenage fiction children's author. Um, he's still writing, 
And Redshift is fantastic because, it, again, rather like Cloud Atlas, it's one of those things where there are three different narratives and they all weave together in literally the last line of the book. And so that sense of magic as this, um, the interlocking, interrelatedness of all things. So it's not the spooky thing that sits outside of the world, it's embedded within the world. Yeah? And, that, that, and, and books and films and things that sort of point towards that in some way. You know, and obviously the Wicker Man, just for the pure delight of toasting all those scenes. <laughs> <laughs> you stole my two movie suggestions. That, those are the ones I was going to pick. But, yeah. uh, and obviously, um, Robert Anton Wilson's The Illuminatus trilogy has got loads of magic type stuff in it. And even the historic Illuminati trilogy that he did much more recently, that's got some very interesting sort of magic and the way that magical orders affect the world in a sort of spooky club kind of way. It's very, very good for that. All right. I'm going to ask you best and worst magical experiences, starting with best. No, worst. So that you can think, oh, what is the best one in case you want to say something like, oh, I had kids or got married or, or one of those kind of things. But worst or scariest? Biggest, like, war scar? I've got one. Okay. 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 Go for it. So, so when, when we say best or worst, it's a bit like when, you know, uh, one might describe an acid trip as uh, as as um, easy or difficult, yeah. um, and so difficult ones. Um, I think that the, uh, there was a ritual that I did, which was a ritual piercing that involved me um, being pierced through the chest and hanging off uh, a, a yew tree in uh, Sussex um, for for I don't know a couple of hours, something like this, hour and a half. Um, and that was the uh, one of the most difficult. The reason it was the most difficult was because it was um, it was terribly frightening. I thought, God, this is going to really fucking hurt. Um, and who are these people anyway? And what if some dog walker happens upon all these people tied to a tree and blood coming out of them and four inch, you know, four millimeter needles through them and so forth? So it was, you know, it was an anxiety provoking moment and experience. And I remember lying down, and I remember um, using, you know, uh, um, all of my Zen powers to try and relax and relax and relax and relax. And then the I had been told that I should breathe in and out three times, and on the last exhalation, the needle would go through. So the gentleman who was piercing me said, "Breathe in," and I did. And he pierced it through. And then he did the other one, and then I was on that tree. And it was really, really intense moment of being present in the real. The only time I've experienced uh, a, um, a sense of that was the time, the two occasions I've been present at the birth of my children. Um, so it's capital R, real. And the whole experience was so intense that what happened to me afterwards was that none of the rest of my life had been scripted. I was so worried about this incident, mm. about this event, that I had no notion of the drive back in the car after back into Brighton and so I found myself in this unscripted bit of my world and of course what happened is it collapsed and so that was very transformative and very difficult and very powerful and I'm very honoured to have been asked to take part in that ritual and I'm very pleased I did it but it was very challenging. Has Nikki thought of a worst or most difficult yet before we circle back to the bests? Uh, that's difficult. I yeah, think right. that the because some of the some of the things that I'm I do in magic stuff I can't talk about because of Very secrecy oaths and yeah. things. Uh, but um, to describe it is sort of um, in quite vague terms. The worst time that I had in a magical situation was a group situation, and there was lots of stuff going on, and. I wasn't quite following it and then suddenly it was like right now you're on and I was like I don't know it was similar to that sort of unscripted kind of thing mm. and I'm just going I don't know what's been happening and I don't know what's supposed to happen next and I certainly don't know how to get from one place to the other and I'm like in charge in brackets so you've been like, drinking no oh. <laughs> um, and I was like I don't know what on earth is expected of me here uh, and just completely froze and just went what do I do what do I do what do I do and so I just took solace in the sort of like the banishing with laughter idea and just laughed at it and then someone else took over but it was just awful I just felt like I had no clue about how to do anything and it was you know awful what led up to that moment 
that you can tell us about. Yeah. <laughs> um, Are you just on your phone? <laughs> no, I've been in another room because the thing that had happened immediately prior to that, I didn't want to take part in, so I'd gone out of the room and was chatting with a couple of other people in another room and then mm-hmm. came back into the main temple space where the working was happening. And so that's why I didn't know what had been happening before. And that's, so I, I can see. I, would have been, I was put onto the spot, like completely, like going, what, and so I shouldn't have been in a way, but. I, so I, I so like should, isn't yeah. that interesting for yeah. that to happen? You know, you're a magician with you know twenty plus experience uh, years within the IoT, and you found yourself in that situation. You would ex- mm. describe that as the most challenging magical experience because that was that was the, the the nature of the question. Yeah. yeah. So that it was because you know, I had nothing that I could draw on. It was just like yeah. I don't know what to do, and that people were expecting me to, um, and it was like it was like everything was going to fall apart if I didn't do it properly. And, it was like, uh, uh, uh. and I didn't do it properly. I just, but I just because I laughed about it rather than cried and ran away sobbing or anything worse or didn't get angry about it I just went <laughs> I don't know um, and then the, the evening sort of dissolved into a nice sort of pleasant party so it was alright and people sat around and drank tea and things so it was alright but it was at the time I was just like all the pressure and all the eyes were on me and it was just like <gasps> being found wanting in front of your tribe exactly yeah, it's a yeah, difficult yeah, experience really deep Always scary thing especially experience. in an intense environment yep. like that so yeah yeah is that why you carry around those little glass vials of stage smoke now so you can just throw them <laughs> on the ground and leave? I believe the doors were locked. So <laughs> locked even then. All right, we're have a crack at... Uh, yeah, let's go with best rather than easiest just to move the, um, the slider to a different track. Like either, oh, oh that s- time I used magic and won the lottery or um, I had a numerous experience on top of a mountain and this happened and now I shoot lasers with my eyes. I was very, very pleased when I was about, um, I think about 12, 13, something like this, and did a piece of uh, candle magic to help my dad sell his van just before Christmas. And that worked. Nice. And that was just really interesting because I remember at the time thinking, okay, so I've done this ritual and this event has taken place that I wanted to happen and, you know, um, it's all good and that's, that's really interesting. Um, and I think it was the best because I also realised that I should hold on really lightly to any causal relationship Mm -hmm. between what I had done and what had happened and so it was the best in the sense that you know luckily rather than becoming some kind of you know obsessive nut job I was able to kind of say okay well you know yes this is a practice that interests me and I believe it is able to affect the world but also I'm going to just hold that really lightly and gently so experiences like that, um, uh, experiences f- uh, for me of um, very often some of the best magical experiences have been working with with uh, with other groups. So when I've been kind of a guest with with, with another group, um, I remember doing a, um, uh, an, a big ritual with um, uh, some people from the Order of Bards over and Druids. And you know some of their ritual practice is quite you know, it's quite hardcore. I mean we did this thing where we made this amazing big fire labyrinth and people, you know, we sang music and the, the flames leapt up and then the flames died down, people walked to the labyrinth and they were taken into two separate areas, one of which was the kind of the overworld, which is this bright white tent where they uh, they had div- did divination and they sang the, the chant Arwen. Um, and then the other side was uh, a, a dark tent where they were ritually held at knife point there to the neck and then lay down to to meditate on death and my job was to be the ferryman to move people to the realm of the dead and I had to do this through the whole process which took about three and a half four hours something like this continuously chanting this sort of you know this uh, um, I think Oum rune or something that I'd been given and these people held this space together so powerfully and so well over such a huge area you know it's a big field basically I think in Sussex um, and at the end of our ritual in the the the, um, uh, the the camp of death, the realm of the underworld, everyone came out. People were sort of we were standing out in the darkness, and we all linked hands. And Dave Smith, Dave the Bard, Dan the Bard, um, who was who was running that group, and we all sort of you know he, he's bringing us back to kind of being in the world and da da da. And then this cow uh, in the corner of the field just went, Moo! and Dave just said and banished with laughter 
And David I've been, and I've been working with, you know, doing chaosy stuff together. He'd come to like a working group and so on. And I'd learned stuff from him and he'd invited me to this ritual. And then we banished with a technique that I was familiar with from my tradition. And that was really, really lovely. Uh, I felt really honoured. So I have, if, you know, that's a kind of an answer to that. That's one. a good answer. That's a good answer. That's a lot to live up to, actually. Mm. It's very hard to think of a specific thing because there's so many different things that you could mention. So just yeah. the general sort of when spells work is obviously particularly good, um, particularly when they work for other people. And so you've done a spell for someone else and then they come back and go, oh, it worked! And you go, yeah. Of course it did. Yeah, they all do. Don't look into yeah. it or anything. Yeah. Which you hold on too lightly, of course. Of but course, it's, it's, it's of course, very nice to get that nice little... Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know the diagnosis came back and I haven't got it? Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, the house is. I've got the house. Yeah, and the job, and yeah, etc. So that's always quite nice. Um, and then there's different rituals that I've been to, which have just been really, really beautiful and amazing, and just like wow. And it's impossible to pick one of those out. So there was really nice Ganesh puja that I went to, um, which was like we, where I was. Um, I was actually chanting some. Of, uh, there was some of us that were doing the hundred eight name. There's hundred eight salutations. And I had, I don't know, number 47 to number 80-something, something like that. We sort of divided it up between us. So did some, And I'd learnt them all off by heart, because I wanted to be flash about it. And yeah. it's just better to have it in your head rather than reading it, because it's just nicer. Mm. So I'd, I'd use different mnemonics, it's sort of um, tricks to learn them. And we had, like, there was about 40 people there. And there was all candles and there was flowers and a big Ganesh statue. And everyone there was, like, bells and stuff like that. And so we were doing it all, like very properly mm-hmm. and it went on for a good hour because there was all sorts of chanting and different other bits and different points of it and I got to do my bit doing that there and I got it all right and it was just really nice to be part of a ceremony that was so beautiful and there's sort of some, some bits at the end of it that were really they were just really lovely just the whole sort of sense of being in a room with people or all making noise together which is always a nice thing to do that's why I was in a punk band not quite the same sort of noise though this is much more beautiful uplifting oh there's all sweets and you get up to the, go to the, to the altar and leave offerings and uh, so that that's probably a sort of one that stands out there's so many other rituals that are just amazingly beautiful to be at um, and some of those would be sort of like the best experiences that I've had by, by, by being by doing magic, I suppose, um, and also that that thing where you sometimes um, you, you you have moments in your ordinary life where suddenly you'll be in a state of magical consciousness yeah. as well. I really like that, um, mm. which is very difficult to explain because they're very deeply personal. And trying to explain to someone else about them, it sounds a bit crazy because it's like, oh, I met this god and he talked to him. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. 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 So I was explaining. There, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, I was just saying so it's like, like, so like. You, you, you can't know. Really do that when you're actually because it doesn't make any sense when you actually try and put it into words because it's the whole experience yeah, of it. And it, yeah. it wasn't. Uh, yeah. So for me, it's a bit like like I, I suddenly stepped into the pages of you know the Invisibles. Yeah, yeah, t- yeah, I'm yeah, in yeah, this yeah. graphic novel and there are these. You know, this is amazing and and it's yeah. It sounds a bit straight. Yeah, it's a bit that, isn't it? It's the latent. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> no, I, th- I think that's the payoff. I think that's why, because I mean, it's weird and it's difficult and it's sometimes expensive and you have strange dreams and uh, it's not um, it's not always fun. But the the payoff I think for magic is that you will yeah I'll be on a bus and you mm-hmm. suddenly mm-hmm. see um, the like the fizzy pixels of reality and then you go yes. oh look at what's talking to me. Yes, yeah. Uh, I had one of those on a bus as well, where I was like on a bus and I'd been reading something about programming the universe, and I was on the bus and suddenly everything turned into zeros and ones. Not like literally, but I could like see that everything yeah. was based on this sort of quantum foam that then emerged into atoms and then people and stuff. But it just happened. Yes. Yeah. And I, hopefully that's a payoff for the people around us who aren't at all involved in it, because yeah, crazy things happen. Hopefully for the best around people. The, the dozens of times you end up having like those really bizarre synchronicities. Um, mm-hmm. We were talking about before we moved to the suburb we were in. Um, my partner and I were in a pub drinking, and because it didn't it didn't feel right, we had to go to the next place. And I said, I feel like the underlying codes that sort of power this uh, area of London have changed. And then our flatmate walked by the pub and came in, and she said. Um, the deli, which is a very famous West London deli that had been there for 35 years, had just closed. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that was, this, is, this is where Anna Del Conte used to do her shopping uh, when she lived in London, uh, even Agella, before she became what she is. It, it was like this sort of uh, outpost of uh, amazing 
continental food in like the 70s when it was difficult to get and you had to buy your olive oil from a pharmacy and all this. Yeah. Uh, and this cornerstone, like genuine sort of egregoric cornerstone of this area of London closed. Mm. And I'd said the underlying code that changed before. And my partner just looks at me and I'm like, well, you know, you know how this goes. So I, that I think is a payoff. Um, mm. And obviously the soon to arrive um, vast wealth. all right final thing Uh, stuff to tell people for this year what should they read advice for the kids these days buy my book come see us in Glastonbury anything come see us in Glastonbury absolutely which is on the spring equinox Mm mm-hmm That'd be good. Uh, so that's the what's it called? Organs of the Body of God, something the like that. The Occult Conference. The Occult Conference, yeah. 2014. Um, yeah, that will be really interesting. I'm I'm really looking forward to um, being at that, and also kind of because because I've got the kind of connection to to several of those traditions as well. Kind of seeing seeing you know what kind of conversations will emerge from that. that that's that would be really cool. Um, I'm going to. Uh, take some of the material for the Chaos Craft project that I've been working on for a little while and we're going to produce that um, as a book so this is about this idea of taking the um, the sort of neo-pagan kind of wheel of the year the, the P. Carroll's um, it, uh, Colours of Magic subtly rearranged um, he told me it wasn't a heresy so that was fine because <laughs> um, uh, I did ask really? it was only polite um, hey, he stole them. Yeah, Come on. I said, Pete. <laughs> no, I've, you know, I said, Pete. No, I've looked at these. Yeah, and they, they don't follow like a cabalistic arrangement. And obviously, they're opposites and shit. But like, why is that one on that direction? And he just said, Well, it's it's, it's pretty much random. <laughs> so um, I said, It's okay to rearrange them. And he went, Oh, you're, yes, you won't be committing any terrible heresy or anything. <laughs> so. So what we've done is we've been doing the sequence of rituals with our with our group, looking at the kind of relationship of those festivals, looking at the colours, looking at a methodology of doing magic, which is a kind of chaos bring and share type model, but is thematically linked to the colour and the season, and and building up practices and and creating a kind of you know, uh, and um, this there's been this sort of um, within our group this. Uh, Emergent tradition, I suppose. So, so we've we've created this. It isn't um, a, an exclusively IoT group, um, but we've created this sort of system, and we want to kind of publish something about that um, and about the relationship of those um, uh, eight elements within uh, magical practice, and also the relationship of that to uh, mindfulness meditation, which is something that several people in the group are really, really interested in and, and engaged with, you know, using therapeutically and, 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 and so on. So that's what we're going to do. That's one thing. Nice. Mm, yes. So I shall be, <clears throat> um, I shall be helping with the publishing of book thing and I'm going to be writing a book which I've been getting my head a bit round. I've got, had some notes for a couple of years and I've now got to the point where I was like, right, I need to actually get it written now. Understood. Get my head round it a bit more. So I should be doing that and there's various sort of... Um, I think I'm doing doing a talk in Norwich in the autumn and at the Harvest Moon um, gathering that they have and then there's something in Bath but I'm not sure of the date of that and possibly a literary festival somewhere in Cornwall and Man, it's getting on the internet yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 just go, go to the blog of Baphomet and look it up brilliant yeah. 